I do think going backwards is a, a semblance of just comfort mm -hmm. and safety. I give 500 bucks to say that an ex has called or texted you. Tonight, today. Since we've been on the couch. Ooh. I'm gonna go I as far as I didn't bet against you. <laughs> <I'm> like, oh! <laughs> Self-sabotage. Now, can we please spend some time with those two words? Taking care of your mental health has been stigmatized, and I think we're getting to a place where we're finally recognizing that this is not just a white people thing. Welcome to the final episode of the Harlem After Show. Hey. It just takes one, hon. If, like me, you just finished season two on Prime, then you already are in your feels, and here is where we unpack some of that. So today, myself, a group of my friends, the cast of Harlem, and of course you, are gonna talk about Quinn growing in her understanding of her mental health needs. Angie taking space from her friends in order to clear some room for new love. Ty going from a life in these streets to potentially married mom life all in one season. And of course, we gotta talk about Camille and Ian's tragic or finally romantic finale, depending on how you viewed their relationship. So let's start there. Season one of Harlem ended with Camille and Ian rekindling their love, but season two ended with them calling it off again. So which season had it right? Can you really get that old thing back once it's originally lost? Going back to your ex, yay or nay? Nay. nay. Yeah. Across the board, nays? Nay. Yeah. Nay. Nah. <laughs> I mean, I just feel like, you know, if, if um, <clears throat> everyone has a, a, a right, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but I just feel like if you've been fully committed, right, you're both feeding, you know what I'm saying, um, you know, working at it and you really give your best effort and you've laid it all on the line, like, you know, back in football we used to say, you know, leave it on the field. Mm -hmm. If you really left it all out there and you did your best and you right. find yourself flipping that chapter, you know, because of that, I'm okay not turning Going back. Going backwards. You know, I right. I did, yeah. And, and yeah. it is what it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it would be different, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, whatever whatever is the reason that you guys, um, you know, broke up, if, if something isn't gonna be different, then what's the point of going mm -hmm. backwards? Yeah, and sometimes I think uh, there is a way that we can, like, have an ex and then get into a bunch of stuff that make you mix, miss your ex, but, like, not the parts that you, um, that we're not working, right? And but so the then parts you can go working. right, and then you can go back yeah. thinking like, oh, but I wasn't getting this and this and this from these other people, and I got that from you, and mm -hmm. then you remember all the reasons why that actually doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So like, for yeah. me, sometimes going back feels like, even if I feel the urge or I feel like the miss or the desire. I'm always reminded like, oh, you have to choose you and what you're choosing now is a semblance of comfort that isn't really realistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because mm -hmm. even if a person, even if the person that you were with, say both of you guys both grow and you're in a different space of life, you know, it is possible that you might not have the same issues that you have, but I do think going backwards is a, a semblance of just comfort mm -hmm. and safety mm -hmm. versus, and, and not to say that that, I mean, there's people who, you know, separate or, you know, dated in college and then got married and then, you know, 20 years on the line, they end up getting married, you know, after having dated 20 years ago. So, I mean, I think it's, there's no right fit for anyone in particular, but mm -hmm. that makes the most sense to me. Yeah. All of this fire in this one air is saying no, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. right, yeah. I think it's also the clarity of retrospect, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, like for me personally, it's like I looking back, I know why those didn't work, whether it was me or them or me in that space with them. You know Ever. what I mean? Like, you know, and so mm -hmm. I feel like looking back, it's like I've learned the lessons that I've needed to learn and, and I'm I'm so good on that. And like knowing being so clear about who I am now and you know, and what that looks like. So I think that too. Let's do a roll call. We got Jason back from episode two. Hey. Kevin here for the first time. The baddest bitch alive. Amber back from episode three. What's up? And Camille Lewis is here for the first time, our resident therapist who is here to ensure that we don't go, go too far left or too far right in this conversation. Hey. Let's talk about going back to an ex. Nay. Hey. Fuck no. I'm a yay too. I'm a boat. Yikes on the bike. You're not well, in the middle, Amber. Why are you lying? Middle. Amber. Why you say? You chipped right off. I said yay and nay. I give 500 bucks to say that an ex has called or texted you. Tonight. Today. Since we've been on the couch. Ooh. I'm going to go I as far as I didn't bet against you. I'm like, oh! And that's what I was looking at the phone. <laughs> Um, because she's seen me do it a bunch of times. I think it's a yay if there's an opportunity for growth. I think going back after it's passed is just silly. Have your moment, move on, see what's next. Keep going. 
I'm actually surprised that you're a yay, Camille. Yeah. yeah. Is this therapist Camille yay or personal life Camille yay? Oh, really? Unfortunately, it's going to be both. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think that things are complicated and nuanced in ways that we might not understand. And I think depending on the circumstances that lead to a breakup, things can be irreparable or they can be revisited in a chance for healing. I think healing happens relationally and so it might be able to overcome some hurt and really revisit a connection that was really valuable. Mm -hmm. Do you think you need a therapeutic medium intervention in order to attempt love again with somebody that you failed at previously? I would strongly recommend it. I think that it's just great to have a support especially if you feel like you're running into the same conflict over and over again or there's unresolved issues. Having somebody outside to kind of give some support and I guess insight into what they're witnessing can help you see, see each other. Now, you said nay. Yeah, yeah, Jason, yeah, I feel yeah. like if I was your ex, I could come back whenever I felt. That's the energy <laughs> that's you're giving. The problem, <laughs> that's the problem. They all feel like they could come back whenever they want, up to like a week ago. Like, well, I'm still friends with my exes. You can still be friends with them, but mm -hmm. going through those experiences over and over right. and over again, you figure it out. You're like, maybe this isn't going to work, but you could come back anytime just to figure out that it's not going to work. I think that in these instances, sometimes you have to be curious about where you're willing to compromise. I don't know. I think kind of going back to an ex is self-sabotage, kind of like Camille and Ian. Self-sabotage. Now, can we please spend some time with those two words? Because they dominated the conversation on the cast of Harlem, particularly Megan Good's character on Twitter. And I think some further discussion is in order. So let's start by outlining the tight bond that self-sabotage has with self-worth. Self-worth is the internal sense of being good enough and being worthy of love and belonging from others. And since belonging is very high up there on all of our list of priorities, protecting self-worth is business that the mind loves to mind. Now, although self-worth is about internal feelings, self-worth theory is based on the idea that we all gravitate to external activities and people that boost our self-worth. That also means that we are motivated to use strategies to avoid things that negatively impact our self-worth. In short, our brain loves doing stuff it has receipts of validation for and hates doing anything it secretly knows that we're not that good at because it makes us feel bad about ourselves. One of those avoidance strategies is self-handicapping, or what most of us call self-sabotage, which we can define as anything we purposefully do or don't do to undermine our likelihood of success. Now, when we indulge in self-sabotage, we can admit to failure without hurting our self-worth by also admitting to an unflattering fault. For example, it's a whole lot easier to say, oh, I failed that test because I procrastinated, than it is to say, I failed the test because I don't understand the material. And furthermore, I don't know if I'm smart enough to get it, even if I did give myself enough time. In romantic relationships, self-sabotage can look like reducing our effort so we can always say, well, whatever, I didn't really try, if things don't really progress. Essentially, when we engage in self-sabotage, we redirect our efforts from building competence to building excuses. Now, truth be told, the scary thing is the opposite of self-sabotage is not success. It's an all-out attempt at success that, yeah, still might lead to failure. But at least this way we can feel pride and peace in knowing that we did our best, even if our best wasn't good enough for that go. Plus, we can gain more clarity on how to improve our efforts in the future. And this is where we could end this conversation. But let's also consider that ego protection is not the only reason people self-sabotage. First, in some cases, what looks like self-sabotage may actually be our intuition guiding us away from what we should do so we have space to discover what we actually want to do. Second, now that we know more about mental health, we have to also acknowledge that there are other factors outside of a person's level of laziness and perseverance that play a role in someone's ability to try their best in life and in love. We need to talk. Even less good. I have spent so much of my life trying to be whoever someone interested in me wanted me to be and I lost myself. I'm beside the point in my own life. And when it all caught up with me this year, trust me, it was not pretty. Meeting you this time around, it was wonderful, but I need to figure out who I actually am and then fall madly 
in love with that person before I can know exactly who I want to be with. It's, it's easy to love something that seems perfect, to love someone that seems perfect. None of us are. Mm -hmm. All of us are searching for that love that sees us exactly as we are. Yes. You know, no masks, no veneers, no performance, just raw. Yes. And for you to say, that's good enough. Yes. You know, that, that that's love. I so agree with the way that Quinn did that because on the other side of things, when my anxiety was crazy and I felt like I was in a situation being a people pleaser, I was putting somebody else's feelings before mine. And it got to the point where I had an explosion and I had to push away aggressively. And if I would have protected myself and my energy and put up those boundaries before, I would have done it in a healthier way of explaining. And then I think in that way you can see who's really for you and who's not, right? Yeah. If you explain to somebody and say, this is what I'm going through and they're understanding and they understand you, you might have a future when you take care of yourself. And then if not, then that's not the person for you. Mm -hmm. So I learned the way to do it by not doing it properly. Have you guys ever dated someone before who had mental health concerns? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've dealt with uh, people with a d depression or anxiety um, and bipolar as well. And as long as like you're helping me help you, like, you know, I, I'm very understanding and but I also want to see that you're doing the work because growing up with people um, in my family that suffered from bipolar or just mental health issues, I know how it is and you really got to be owning up to your sh and then doing the work. So as long as like you're on that side doing it, then I can, I can be there with you in the journey, you know, and it's all good. A big part of doing the work too is medication. Mm -hmm. And to getting our Quinn back. Oh, thank you guys. Although I will say that much of the credit goes to the meds. To the meds. <laughs> you know something, I, I really thought that I would feel drugged or sedated while I was on them, but it's been a few weeks and I don't. I mean, I seem like me, right? Yeah, you're perfect. I was really happy to see Gwen so openly talk about medication with her friends because as somebody who works in the mental health field, it's understandable and I come up against a lot of resistance from clients to talk about their medication or to share that they're on medication with partners or potential partners and so to have this just be like this is just something that I'm doing like I think of mental health care as something that you just do to care for yourself to see this visually represented and to have there be such communal support is really great to see. Mm -hmm. I think we're getting to a place where we're finally recognizing that this is not just a white people thing that it affects right everyone and it affects different identities and I think to incorporate medication into your treatment of yourself and your care of yourself I really really support it I think that it can work especially if you're working in tandem with like a talk therapist like myself or you have other methods of healing if it's you know Eastern approaches like acupuncture or you know sound healing Reiki all of those things I think that having combined methods of caring for yourself is never a bad thing there's some things that biologically um, or hormonally affect us that can really be supported by medication. So I'm here yes. for it. To the meds. To the meds. <laughs> yes. Another big question that the Quinn storyline brings up is, can you pursue romantic love if you don't have self-love first? Yes. You're a therapist, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, I believe in self-love first because if I am hiding something from me that I don't want to address or I don't want to come up, then my care for you is also steeped in me making sure that you don't get to those parts that I'm hiding either. I think we set such a huge expectation on women to be this thing that is worthy of love. And I think we don't do the same, we don't have the same parameters on men. Men can love while, when they're broke or broken. I hate to do this. This is actually the end of this video, but it's also the beginning of something very cool and very beautiful that we have all done together. The beautiful team behind Harlem was so proud of the conversations that we have been having in this after show that they offered to house the second half of the episode on Prime for a wider audience to enjoy. So please come over to Prime to watch part two of this episode. And when you do come over there, here's what you'll see because even I think healing in, in some aspects, even from stuff when you were a child, still takes a lifetime until you literally leave this planet. Can we talk about how the doctor created hesitation with the IUD though? 
IUDs can be removed just like any other form of birth control. I was under the same impression that I had had to not choose an IUD if children were in my near future. You're sounding toxic right now. Yeah, yeah, a little you bit. Are so, you are. You're like, listen, I'm a great dad. Yeah, you don't and know I'm a good thing. Yourself. It's like, is that it or is this the problem? It's giving gaslight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay.